first of all, I want to request uh, Professor Bhomik, who is a well-known uh, person to many of you, to take the chair for this morning session. And uh, this session will have a more emphasis on uh, what physics can do to neuroscience, particularly to the question of uh, consciousness uh, studies. And uh, in the booklet, you will find a detailed version of the biodata of all the people who are here. So I'm not going to uh, read the biodata of uh, Professor Bhomik. He's such a well-known person, and he has been uh, very popular these days for his books also, kind of uh, thing. And uh, he has encouraged us in initiating this program this year, having an international uh, conference here. Now, the, uh, today there will be some, the first part will be uh, a video by Professor Hammeroff. And uh, Hammeroff was to come here for a conference, but unfortunately he had come a little earlier for another conference. And therefore what we decided was, uh, he gave a lecture in this very hall, and we have video recorded it, and that is going to be shown. And um, after that, there's a lecture by Professor uh, Bhomik, and then, I'm not by Professor Bhomik, Professor Binay Chakravarti, and then there are two lectures in the afternoon, followed by a, a, dis a general discussion on physics and consciousness, in which the three of us, that is uh, Professor Bhomik, Professor uh, Kausik, and myself, will be talking. Now I'll hand over the proceedings of this morning session to Professor Bhomik. Kantan, again, I'd like to welcome you all for a magnificent conference. Now, we start with the video, but uh, since Professor Hammerop is not here, uh, I think he probably doesn't need any introduction, most of you are familiar with his work, but uh, uh, he's basically a physician, uh, and uh, he has been working by himself on the uh, tubulin uh, molecule inside the microtubules of the brain structure. And uh, that provided a natural mechanism for the quantum coherence that Penrose was looking for. And so they teamed up and now have the Penrose hammer of theory. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't hear him in person, but I think seeing is believing, so we're going to see the video now. Thank you very much. Thank you all, Professor Shrikanta and Dr. Minam. Thanks for having me, and, I'm, I'm, and uh, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm very happy that you invited me. So my topic is consciousness in the universe, which is a rather large topic. And uh, if we start with the question of consciousness, we take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world appears before us. Actually, modern science tells us as a representation inside the head. And we have a, an awareness, an experience and I've denoted this as Bing. So Bing in this talk will mean conscious experience as opposed to something the brain might do that is non-conscious on autopilot. So Bing means conscious awareness. And the question is, how does the brain produce conscious awareness? What is consciousness? And this question is approached from neuroscientists who probe the brain, robotics, AI people, artists, physicists, psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, uh, meditators and philosophers. <clears throat> now the origin of consciousness, there are three possibilities. The first, since we're in India, I'll put this first, is that consciousness is intrinsic to the universe as the ground of being, Brahman or God, as suggested by Eastern spiritual approaches. <clears throat> so uh, we know that in Eastern philosophy, consciousness is thought to pervade a deeper, deeper level of reality. Being is everywhere, it's in the universe, and we kind of access or connect to it somehow. But what about the brain and modern science? We know, uh, we know that the brain is, uh, seems to work like a computer, and so how does that uh, connect to the other idea? Well, it doesn't, it hasn't so far, and the main idea in, in modern science and philosophy, Western philosophy, is that during evolution, consciousness emerged from complex computation, 
to represent reality, that the brain is a computer and from it consciousness emerges. This goes back to the ancient Greeks in Western philosophy uh, po who pointed out that the, uh, Plato, for example, that the world out there is all in our head and the brain produces consciousness by complex computation among neurons. So the light enters the brain and produces this image and bing, conscious awareness is produced in the brain. Since we know that, uh, that the brain is made of neurons that have variable connections called synapses, there's a, a major analogy between the brain as computers, synapses as switches, and neuronal firings as bits or states in a computer. This is the, the approach in modern science, and the, the science of the neuron, where we, uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, where we have inputs and one output, and messages thought to propagate along the membrane surface uh, only by uh, uh, depolarization. Now, <clears throat> we can sort of uh, make a simple neuron. If we start with a biological neuron with many, many dendrites and one axon, and the McCullough-Pitts artificial neuron or the perceptron to make this into a computer uh, network, uh, uh, artificial neural network. And here's a toy neuron that's kind of a combination of both, where we have inputs into three main dendrites, cell body, and axon, which can fire. So the idea is that the inputs are integrated in this part of the neuron and then fired down. So you have multiple inputs uh, which are integrated and fired, integrate and fire. That's the usual view of the neuron. So if we make a network of these with inputs over here and outputs going out the other way, we can see that uh, the neurons can more or less function as a computer and give inputs in a, uh, for a given set of inputs, give, have a uh, given set of outputs. However, one might ask, where's consciousness in this? Why should computation, per se, give awareness? Where's the bing? And also, where's synchrony? Because we know that synchronous oscillations in the brain are important for consciousness. And this type of network wouldn't give synchrony. So the general idea of the brain as a neuronal synaptic computer, following only classical physics, and I'll talk about quantum physics later, the problem is that, number one, this approach cannot account for conscious versus unconscious processes. It doesn't give us a threshold. It doesn't say when you have so many bits firing per second, you get consciousness. There's no even prediction of a threshold. It can't distinguish between non-conscious processes and conscious processes. Also, because the activity uh, in the brain that seems to involve integrating inputs happens after we've responded, according to this view, consciousness is an epiphenomenon. Uh, it's after the fact, so, uh, and we act unconsciously and have an illusion of acting consciously. There's no free will. Free will is impossible according to the mainstream approach because conscious, the activity that seems to happen, uh, correlate with consciousness, happens too late. There's a way around this with, in, with quantum physics. And finally, there's no possibility for non-locality, anything like in, through quantum entanglement, for example, or telepathy, ESP, and certainly no possibility for reincarnation, afterlife, and spirituality. So modern science says these, these things are impossible because they're following the, the brain as neuronal synaptic computer in classical physics. So they deem this, this impossible. They also deem free will impossible. <clears throat> so maybe that's wrong. Maybe there's something else. Maybe we need to look to a finer scale. Instead of the neuron being one bit or not, <clears throat> or not we should look deeper inside. For example, if we consider a single cell like a paramecium, it's one cell that can swim around, it uses these cilia made of microtubules, it, uh, it can avoid obstacles and predators, it can find food, it uh, can find a mate and have sex. Uh, and there's no synapses, it's one cell. So you, you can't rely on a network of synaptic connections because there are no synapses, there's just one, one cell. And here's two paramecium, um, having sex, actually, uh, some kind of Kama Sutra position, maybe. And uh, we don't know whether they're conscious or not, uh, whether there's being, but, but we, we can't answer the question. But the point is, if a single cell is as clever and it can learn, it can find, find food, if, if a single cell is that clever, then a neuron in the brain might be more clever than simple one or zero on-off switch. So how does the paramecium do it? Well, if we look inside cells, we see a beautiful... Uh, structure. So here, here's a, one cell here with, with two nuclei, a double nucleated cell. 
and uh, with immunofluorescence, and the yellow and red is the cytoskeleton. The yellow is the microtubules, and the red are the actin. And you can see the, they form the architecture or the scaffolding, the skeletal structure inside, inside the neuron, inside any, any animal cell, including neurons. Now, when cells divide, I don't know if you can see this very well, but here, these structures are called uh, centrioles, and the, and the red are the microtubules, and the chromosomes are in blue, and they're pulled apart by these centrioles, and this has to be precisely perfect, or else you get an abnormal genotype and can have cancer or abnormal development. So the que one question is how these structures know what to do and where to go and how they organize things. And this is the structure of a single uh, uh, half of a centriole, and it's made up of individual microtubules in triplets forming a larger cylinder, which happens to be exactly the size of a, of a photon, of a waveguide. And uh, it, it, in some animals, some, some uh, systems, these structures are sensitive to light. And they're, and they're always found in these double, uh, in these uh, uh, perpendicular arrays, which nobody has really explained why this is. And when cells divide, they replicate and spread apart, and that forms the, the anchor for the, for the new cells. So in neurons, let's look at the microtube, the cytoskeletal structure in neurons, looking at a finer scale in neurons. And basically, here's an axon coming in here. It's got microtubules and, and uh, neurotransmitter vesicles, and here's the synapse, a dendritic spine, and a postsynaptic membrane. Now, most people look for the mechanism of consciousness and, uh, in zone A, at the receptor level, at the membrane level, but I think we also need to look at B, in the microtubules, the structures inside neurons, which turn out to be very good computational devices and capable of performing computation inside uh, neurons. So in the, I got interested in microtubules in the early 70s when I was in medical school and got the idea, I was just learning about computers then, and got the idea that they might be um, uh, information processing devices. And so, for example, here's a microtubule. It's made up of these 13 chains of proteins called tubulin. And uh, we, uh, working with some physicists uh, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, we modeled these as molecular automata. We basically said that each tubulin could be in two different states, open and black and white, open and closed, although the, the mechanical change doesn't have to be that great. And later, we got into a quantum superposition of both states. But just thinking of these two states, and the... Uh, calculating the dipole coupling interactions among the, the tubulins, we modeled it like a cellular automata. A cellular automata is a simple computer system where uh, each subunit interacts only with its neighbors. And this is a famous one called the game of life, and a simple grid. And with simple rules and, and starting conditions, you get information processing and uh, computation. And so we modeled a microtubule as a molecular automata, each, each subunit interacted only with its neighbors, and we found patterns that could move and process information and showed in molecular, in simulation, computer simulation, that microtubules can function as, as uh, computers, as computational systems, and interconnecting microtubules could give you a computational network. So something like this, this is a piece of one microtubule with, with eight time steps, and the switching occurs at, at roughly 10 megahertz. So, uh, uh, so roughly every uh, 100, uh, 10 millionth of a second, you change uh, state and you see information patterns propagating. And we suggest that this could be used to organize things inside the cell and also perhaps play a role in, somehow in consciousness. We also consider that following the helical geometry of the microtubule that you could represent information not as the states of each individual subunit, but as patterns that follow these Fibonacci winding patterns. And uh, we published this in 2002. And one more thing about information processing in microtubules is it regards learning and memory. And memory is, uh, is modeled as, as uh, long-term potentiation, which is a, a system in vitro uh, where high-frequency stimulation of a presynaptic synapse causes uh, long-term changes in the synapse, but these, the proteins mm -hmm. that mediate this are, are short-lived and yet memories can last a lifetime. So the question is, where is memory stored? And we think it may be stored at least temporarily in microtubules. Now, one of the, uh, one of the activities in, in LTP, long-term potentiation, 
is that calcium comes in and activates this snowflake-shaped protein called ca calcium calmodulin kinase 2, CAMK2. And CAMK2 then latches on to microtubules and distributes throughout the cell, and, that, and somehow memory and phosphorylates something, and somehow memory is stored. Well, CAMK2 got our interest because when it's activated, here's this uh, snowflake-shaped uh, structure. Here it is in side view. This is looking on top. When it's activated by calcium, these legs or arms extend out and it looks kind of like some kind of insect, a nanoscale insect with six legs up going down and six legs going up. And here are the phosphorylation sites which would need to phosphorylate something to record uh, information as memory. So we wondered if this might have something to do with the microtubule information processing. And so we modeled also uh, microtubules. So here's a microtubule. These uh, uh, different scales, 20 nanometers, 5. So this is the close-up of an individual tubulin. And you see they have these C-termini that stick out, kind of like hair on the surface of the microtubule. And these are the phosphorylation sites. So we then asked in the computer whether the CAMK2 uh, could, how does that fit or match up with the lattice? And so here's the CAMK2. This is all at a 10 nanometer scale now. And here's the two types of microtubule lattices, the A lattice and the B lattice. And if you overlie, you see that they, they match perfectly. The, the geometry and the size of the CAMK2, which is bringing synaptic information to the cytoskeleton, uh, perfectly fits with either the A lattice or the B lattice. So the CAMK2, it looks like, lands on the microtubule and can deposit information uh, by phosphorylating its, the subunits on which it lands. And we've, we showed the molecular uh, uh, phosphorylation mechanism at the level of amino acids, showing that the, uh, the CAMK2 can phosphorylate uh, given tubulins as a means of, of storing uh, information. And uh, in a paper that uh, is uh, in Journal of Integrative Neuroscience, and we have another paper coming out on this, we showed basically that if we take these neighborhoods, the CAMK2 can impart a lot of information in, uh, in an order, ordered array of bits, which is called a byte, or, or a trinary system, a trite. So depending on, on certain assumptions, you can get up to 5,000 possible states of this one uh, nine-tubulin neighborhood imparted from CAMP K2 in long-term potentiation. So the capacity for information processing from CAMP K2 on a microtubules is enormous, and that would interplay, we think, with information processing ongoing in the, uh, in the microtubule. So <clears throat> a lot of stuff going on in the microtubule. The uh, dynene and kinesin march along and deliver synaptic uh, precursors to the synapse to regulate uh, synapses. And here's the CAMP K2 here. And this is tau protein here, which is important in Alzheimer's disease. If your tau falls off, uh, you, you get Alzheimer's disease, and the microtubule falls apart. And also, it turns out the tau s signals the kinesin wh when to get off, like what, what bus stop to get off at to deliver uh, its cargo to the particular synapse in that area. So um, <clears throat> the question is, how does the tau know exactly where to be and we think that the phosphorylation mechanism imparted by CAMK2 can signal where these things should bind and thus regulate synaptic uh, plasticity and learning and memory. And so when, you, when your microtubules disintegrate and the tau falls off, that's Alzheimer's disease. So there's two lesions in Alzheimer's. One is outside the cell in the amyloid plaques, and uh, the other is inside the cell when the neurofibrillary tangles where the microtubules fall apart. And we have a paper out trying to make the connection between the, the uh, amyloid plaques and the internal microtubule dysfunction. But it's the microtubule dysfunction that causes the cognitive problems, why you get memory problems in Alzheimer's. Okay, so what, what I've suggested so far is this. Now, um, most views of the brain, artificial intelligence, the singularity people who are trying to build a, uh, a, a computer equivalent to the brain, would say that there's... 10 to the 11th neurons per brain, which about 1,000 synapses per neuron, operating at about 10, 100 hertz, roughly, which gives you a, neuro, a brain capacity of about 10 to the 16th operations per second. So AI and singularity people are trying to build a computer uh, 
and they say, well, when we get to 10 to the 16th operations per second, we'll have the equivalent of a human brain. And I don't think that's right <clears throat> for a lot of reasons. If you look at the level of microtubules, you have the same 10 to the 11th neurons per brain. You have about 10 to the 8th tubulins per neuron. And they're switching at about 10 megahertz. So you get about 10 to the 26th operations per second in the brain at the level of microtubules. So 10 orders of magnitude more. And this could explain uh, a lot of things about me memory storage and, and also how a single cell paramecium works. But does it explain consciousness? Not really. Um, it's, it's just more computation. And the same arguments I used before against brain computation would apply here. Where's the bing? Is something else required? And is that something else quantum physics? So this is roughly where I was at in my own work in the early 90s. And I read, uh, fortunately, I read a book by Sir Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind. Some people here have also read that. And it's, it was about quantum physics, and I didn't really understand quantum physics, and I'm not a physicist, and some of you are. So I'm just going to explain it the way I sort of understand it. And that is that, that reality is separated into two different uh, worlds. The classical world that we see around us, where things follow Newton's laws of motion and, and uh, electrum, uh, Maxwell's equations. But at small scales, and sometimes also at large scales, we have the quantum world. And at the, in the quantum world, things are completely different. In the quantum world, particles can exist in multiple possible states or locations simultaneously. This is called quantum superposition. So this pointer could be here and here at the same time, separated from itself. Now, unified particles which become separated can remain connected over distance and time. This is called quantum entanglement. And when this was predicted by, uh, by uh, quantum mechanics, Einstein didn't like it. He called it spooky action at a distance, and he came up with a very famous thought experiment, which, when done uh, 50 years later, turned out to be true and showed that thing, quantum particles can be, uh, once connected, can be separated. And if you make a measurement here, the other one instant, instantaneously reacts, meaning faster than light, which is why Einstein didn't like it. Nonetheless, that's been done over and over again and, and holds every time. The other things about quant th uh, particles can condense into unified entities, quantum coherence, precise location and momentum are uncertain. But the main things, superposition and entanglement, give rise to quantum computers. Now another kind of general view is this, that the quantum world has multiple coexisting possibilities, uh, the classical world is definite, the quantum world has a deep interconnectedness, the classical world is isolated, disconnected, the quantum world is timeless, things can go backwards in time. Uh, classical world has a flow of time. Some people suggest that the quantum world allows access to a universal mind, whereas classical world doesn't allow that. And some people suggest that the quantum world is more or less spiritual, whereas the classical world is material. <clears throat> Why don't we see quantum superpositions in our world? <clears throat> the Copenhagen interpretation, stemming from Niels Bohr back at the turn of the last century, uh, showed that a quantum, super, a quantum uh, measurement would seem to remain in multiple possibilities until observed by a human. And so he, uh, and Schrodinger didn't like this, and he came up with this thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, where poison is released by quantum particles, which, so it's both released and not released. The poison is released and not released. The cat is both dead and alive until someone opens the box and takes a look. And this was good for Bohr because it allowed him to do his experiments, but it put consciousness outside science. Consciousness becomes some weird, strange thing that is outside uh, the scientific experiment that has this effect. So it, it put, some, put consciousness outside of science. It's dualistic. Another possible explanation is that every superposition branches off to form a new universe. This is the multiple worlds hypothesis. So we have an infinite number of parallel universes, multiple worlds hypothesis. A third is decoherence, which states that any, any interaction between a quantum system and a classical system will destroy the quantum system, for example, by heat, by vibrating the quantum system, which is supposedly delicate. But quantum states may be pumped. A laser is a quantum system. This is a quantum system in here, uh, where heat or energy is used to pump the quantum system. And this argument has been used against the idea that there's quantum mechanics in, in biology because... Everybody knows, they say, the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy. Uh, and yet, evidence in recent years suggests functional quantum states in warm biology. So the evidence seems to be pointing more and more towards quantum effects 
in biological system. I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, the fourth possibility for the fate of the superposition uh, is objective reduction, that there's some objective threshold for quantum state reduction. And the best known is that uh, by my colleague, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, who said basically that quantum superpositions which avoid decoherence grow to meet an objective threshold by E equals H over T. A very simple uh, formula coming from the uh, indeterminacy principle, also something like the electromagnetic equation, and, but it's in the quantum realm, because H bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, will undergo spontaneous reduction, self-collapse, or termed objective reduction. So, in other words, Penrose, following Einstein, said an object is equivalent to its space-time curvature. He first addressed the question of what is superposition. And, for example, so here's two space-time sheets. Imagine three spatial dimensions here and one dimension of time. So time is moving this way. And an artic a, a particle in one location would be, say the pointer over here, would be into the screen, and if I move it over here, it's out of the screen. So these space-time curvatures are equivalent to location or states of, a, of, a class, of, of an object. Superposition, Roger then said, is an object in two states or locations uh, equivalent to space-time curvature in both di different directions, a bubble or separation in the structure of reality. So here we have curvature into the screen and curvature out of the screen. So something in two places at once, Penrose said, is a bubble or separation in the fabric of the universe. Now imagine if these were to branch off and each, each curvature would form, its whole new would form its own universe, we would have the multiple worlds hypothesis. But Rogers said, no, these separations are unstable, and after a time, T uh, will collapse to one or the other and choose. <clears throat> and when this, so here's a superposition separation coming up here. When it meets threshold, it will be accompanied by a moment of conscious awareness. So these things are not only unstable, when they do happen, that gives rise to consciousness. Now, the argument for this is m mostly in his first book, The Emperor's New Mind, based on Gödel's theorem and a lot of deductive reasoning. And uh, it basically boils down to it's the only possible answer. When it, as Sherlock Holmes said, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains must be uh, the answer, no matter how seemingly illogical. But there's a lot of reasons to think that, uh, that this is the case, that consciousness occurs when this self-collapse occurs. And I think it's, you could think of this as Atman from Brahman in the Hindu philosophy. I'll come back to that. So what Roger said is that consciousness is an actual physical process, a sequence of quantum state reductions uh, connected uh, by e equals H over T to irreducible, irreducible conscious precursors inherent in fundamental space-time geometry. So it depends on the idea that consciousness, kind of like in the Eastern tradition, is intrinsic to the universe and built into the universe, and that's how Bing happens. Consciousness is built into the universe at the most basic level of the universe. So I think it's kind of, since it's, it's creating classical world, and you could think of consciousness on the boundary between the quantum and classical worlds, a process on the edge between these two worlds. So this gives rise to a third possibility, we mentioned these two before, that biology evolved a connection to consciousness or its precursors intrinsic to the universe. So consciousness or its precursors are in the universe. Biology comes along and adapt, connects to or ad, evolves a mechanism to connect to and take advantage and be part of the consciousness inherent in the universe. And the way that happens is, th we think, through microtubules. Roger didn't have a good uh, candidate for such a uh, connection in his first book, and then I suggested microtubules. So we developed our theory called the orchestrated objective reduction, OR from Roger's objective reduction, orchestrated meaning the biological input which would orchestrate or tune the quantum states. And the basic idea shown here is that the microtubule inside a neuron, each tubulin can be a qubit, a quantum bit of two states, two possible classical states, or a quantum superposition of both states. And uh, historically, this is when we developed our our theory back in 1994 uh, on a hike to the Grand Canyon. There's Roger, there's me, that's David Chalmers, uh, Jeff Tollickson, some other uh, 
people and, and we on this hike we kind of came up with some of the ideas. Here's a more recent picture from Sweden last year. So the basic idea is that each tubulin can be in two states or superposition of both states. And when you get enough superposition to reach this threshold by E equals H over T, you get a collapse and bing, bing happens. So the quantum computing is U and it builds up to this threshold and then reaches threshold and then instantaneously it reduces and each of these gray superposition tubulins chooses a classical black and white one and there's a moment of consciousness, bing. So looking at it in this way, you can see that the gray is the superposition and uh, bing would happen here between steps six and seven because that's when E becomes equal to H over T. And a sequence of conscious moments, for example, at 40 hertz, 40, uh, uh, 40 times a second, uh, would be something like this. And this is where consciousness seems to occur at 40 hertz, 40 times a second. And you can have backwards, backward information which would rescue consciousness from being epiphenomenal and give the possibility for free will. Um, let me let's see, show this real quick. This is from a BBC show. It just kind of gives Within a nice illustration. It's a forest of neurons. The principal way brain cells communicate with each other is by exchanging chemicals. That's the large scale view which all biologists understand. But in the neurons, is a denser jungle of tiny structures called microtubules. Constantly flickering when you're conscious, they stop functioning under anesthetic. Hammerov concluded these microtubules must be an essential element in what creates consciousness. They create a secluded environment where quantum events could occur. He believes it's due to these quantum events that consciousness occurs at all. Seems better with a British accent sometimes. So uh, the other question we faced was, let's say you have a quantum state in one, uh, in microtubes, and one, how would it spread to the other? And we, we suggested that happens through structures called gap junctions, which also gives rise to synchrony, this sideways synchrony. And so if we go back to our network here and open a gap junction and allow the, the quantum state to grow, shown in stripes, you eventually you reach threshold, you get bing, and bing actually moves around the brain. And I think this is what happens. The brain is active all the, all the time, non-consciously, and we have a zone of synchrony moving around the brain and wherever that is, that, uh, that the content of that area becomes conscious. And uh, I have a new paper out with Mark Ebner uh, shown here. All of these are on my website, and I'll give you the, the uh, URL later. So let's talk a little bit about E equals H bar over T. E is the gravitational self-energy of the superposition the degree of mass or space-time geometry, their equivalent, separated from itself, h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, and t is the time at which OR and a conscious moment occur. So um, just some numbers, E is gravitational self-energy that um, can be given by this equation where e A sub C is the separation distance, the super, how far in the superposition is the tubulin is separated from itself. So um, it turns out the separation is only at the level of a car the, the diameter of a carbon nucleus. So uh, it's very, very small. The, the separation is very, very tiny. If you, look, you could see a carbon atom or, or could see it, you wouldn't notice it because the separation is so tiny. Nonetheless, it's the effect in space-time geometry. So for T equals 25, for gamma synchrony, E is quantum superposition of 2 times 10 to the 10th tubulins, and at about 10 to the 8th tubulins, assuming 1% involved, this is about 20,000 neurons worth for each moment of conscious awareness. And this is a pretty good number compared to other, uh, other models coming from cognitive science and neuroscience about, about how many neurons for consciousness. Now, if we think, go back to the original question about evolution, where, where did uh, consciousness emerge in the course of evolution? Here's the Earth being formed 4.85 billion years ago. Here's when the cytoskeleton came in, according to Mar Lynn Margulis, by symbiosis. And most people would say, you know, it depends on your view. Some people say that consciousness just happened very recently with tool making and language and humans. Some people would, would say, you know, all the way back from plants. And I don't think anybody knows the answer, but if you apply E equals H over T, you get to the Cambrian evolutionary explosion, uh, which is when all the animal phyla developed in a very relatively brief 10 million years, and we see these organisms at the beginning that are very similar to organisms today, uh, 
uh, urchins and tiny worms, and we know that they have microtubules. So I'm suggesting that, that, conscious, that consciousness came on the scene, uh, which is when all the animal phyla developed in a very relatively brief 10 million years, and we see these organisms at the beginning that are very similar to organisms today, uh, uh, urchins and tiny worms, and we know that they have microtubules. So I'm suggesting that, that, conscious, that consciousness came on the scene big time here and that, uh, through these organisms, and that accelerated evolution. And if you look at one of these organisms, imagine uh, a cross-section through one of these axonemes, you see that they have this double helical array of microtubules. So each of these circles, each of these small circles, is a microtubule in cross-section. And we have this double helical. And so there's about 10 to the 9th tubulins in an axoneme. So consciousness might have first had consciousness in terms of a, a representation of the outside world might have first happened uh, in these types of structures. Now, why would there be conscious experience? Why is there bing? So if we go back to this uh, and, and look at the curvature of space-time, there's a superposition and then the self-collapse occurs and then one space-time is chosen. That's how we choose. And this choice is influenced by information, uh, Penrose said, embedded in, Platon in, in the universe at its most fundamental level. So, for example, uh, the traditional view of the perception of a rose would be that there's a particular pattern of brain activity in her brain of redness gives rise to bing, whereas we would say that the redness is intrinsic in the space-time geometry in the rose, so, and also that's recreated in her brain. So you can have the bing, the, this particular space-time uh, arrangement in her brain that gives rise to uh, conscious experience. And also, the information can, can influ information embedded in space-time geometry can influence the choices made in each, uh, in each uh, objective reduction. And this could be something like intuition, instinct, uh, follow the way of the Tao, may the force be with you. I'm not sure what the right term would be in, in Hindu, Hindu philosophy, but, but imagine uh, that this windsurfer is, in, is aiming for B, but some platonic influences, maybe in the Akashic record, will send him or her to A or C uh, occasionally, and he doesn't quite know why. It's just kind of following the way of the universe. So this is a possible possibility also. So as I, as I said, in Eastern philosophy, consciousness pervades this deeper level, and we're just accessing, uh, accessing to it. And uh, as Freeman Dyson said, mind and intelligence are woven into the fabric of the universe. And the Hindu, uh, Hindu religion uh, tradition have the Akashic record of a storehouse of information. And we, we know also that the universe is arranged kind of in, in a higher, uh, like a fractal hierarchy, and at the very basement level, the Planck scale. This is from Brian Greene's book about string theory, but it applies to quantum gravity or however you want to look at it, that every, few order, every three or four orders of magnitude, the information repeats. And at the most basic level, the Planck scale, the tiniest level, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, is this vast treasure house, warehouse of information. Now, what does this look like? Um, it's approached through string theory, uh, where it's thought to look like this, uh, loop quantum gravity, spin networks, something like that. So the idea is that each of these edges would average a Planck length of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and so there's an enormous capacity for information at that level, assuming we can access and select to it. Now, the other way to look at it, even below the level of, of those, is through twister theory, which is what Roger's been talking about for many, many, many years, and uh, is becoming popular now. And uh, um, so we would look something like this. This is what the universe would look like. And it's kind of a fractal. You, you have these sheaves that are, that are inside other sheaves and, and so forth. So this is what the universe kind of looks like if we could see the fine scale of it. So I mentioned that it's a fractal, and we have different levels. And there's more and more evidence that consciousness and brain function follow 1 over f, uh, scale-free dynamics, something like a fractal. And here I apply e equals h over t to different uh, uh, modes of, of brain activity. Default mode switching is very slow, about every 10 seconds. EEG is, is faster, roughly uh, uh, 40 hertz. Uh, and microtubule activities get faster at different levels. And you can, for each of these, uh, it, e, by E equals H over T, you'd have more and more tubulins. So if we got down to this level, there's about 10 to the 19th, 10 to the 20th tubulins in the brain. 
So even though people say, well, we only use a fraction of the brain, that may not be true if we go to a deeper level. And by deeper level, I mean through meditation, through altered states, through whatever you want to call it, some kind of even astral projection going to deeper levels, uh, both in the brain and even below the brain, or you could say outside of the brain, because when you get faster than this, uh, this energy can just occur in space-time geometry. This struck me as being similar to uh, Loka's, and I had a conversation with uh, Deepak Chopra about this, and he explained to me that Loka's are, are levels that you can go to, and as you go deeper, you, kind of, you get more and more uh, enlightened, so to speak. And so I think what might happen is that E equals H over T, consciousness goes to lower and lower in terms of smaller scale, but also vaster in terms of information and, and uh, intensity of experience. So that even something like uh, astral projection or out-of-body experiences uh, might, might happen in this way. The consciousness just goes to a deeper level in space-time geometry. And, for example, out-of-body experiences, uh, near-death experiences. And recently, it, uh, you know, the white light uh, phenomenon that people uh, talk about and uh, recently, somebody, uh, 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 this, this fellow, Dr. David Ayang, and also Dr. Lakmir Chala, have been recording uh, uh, EEG, processed EEG, using the, this anesthesia monitor, the BIS, which gives you a number from 0 to 100. And basically, 80 to 100 are, uh, is when you're, you're awake. And uh, f uh, under anesthesia, they, you're, we're supposed to keep our patient between 40 and 60, and below that isn't so good. So these are patients who were, who were uh, basically dying patients, and they, with, uh, support was withdrawn. The ventilator was turned off, and the, the meds, the drugs were, were taken away, and they were allowed to die. And they put this, this brain monitor on it, and in these two studies, 10 out of 10 cases, they found that when this number dwindled down to zero, experience, and maybe even the soul leaving the body, might be, might be measurable. So uh, let me show you one more. This is a TV show about reincarnation that came to ask me. As a computer of a hundred billion simple switches, each neuron being a switch, you can fire or not fire. But neurons as a cell are incredibly complicated. And I think we have to go down a level below the level of neurons, inside the neurons, to the level of the microtubules. The blood stops flowing and the oxygen is being delivered and the brain starts to lose it, die essentially. The quantum information that is consciousness including memories, isn't necessarily lost, but to dissipate and enlarge. So it is possible that consciousness, including memories, can exist outside the brain, outside the body. And in the case of near-death and body experience, would go back inside. If the patient died, then perhaps could be drawn back into another organism, another set of microtubules in the zygote and embryo. It's laid out a plausible theory about how consciousness could exist. This guy is, is, is sympathetic. So the lady is, is, is hardcore neuroscientist. It's possible, I hope so. Uh, we'll find out, maybe. I don't know. I do think people who say that it's possible are just wrong because we don't understand what consciousness is. If we had a good explanation for consciousness based on the brain as a computer, then I would say no. But I think it's possible. I learned a lot about how Dr. She's the skeptic. In terms of consciousness and its representation in the brain. But what he's presented to us is a theory. He doesn't have direct evidence. And only time will tell whether the theory is correct. So I don't claim evidence. I'm just claiming the scientific plausibility. Okay, let me, uh, let me wrap up uh, with uh, some uh, skeptical uh, responses from, from our opponents, you might say. Uh, for example, uh, Max Tegmark, uh, uh, physicist in 2000, wrote a paper that the brain is too warm People were, everybody was saying the brain is too warm and wet for delicate quantum effects. And he came up with this equation uh, for decoherence time, which predicted something like the, the microtubule quantum state would decohere in 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Notice he had uh, temperature in the numerator, temperature in the numerator, which means that as the temperature rose, it should get longer. But, so it doesn't really make sense. But anyway, uh, we, uh, we responded in the same journal and just by calculation. So he had a uh, 10 to the minus 13 seconds, and, um, but he had the separation of 24 nanometers, and our separation is uh, the Fermi length, as I mentioned before, so that was seven orders of magnitude right there. So we calculated uh, uh, microtubule quantum states could last uh, up to a tenth of a second. 
Uh, but again, this was just theoretical. And in the meantime, uh, from photosynthesis and other, other work came along suggesting uh, that it actually happens. Uh, let me just briefly go through a couple other complaints. Uh, these guys said that our proposal is not biologically feasible, and the reasons were really silly, actually. The first one was that, uh, uh, well, let me just show you. What they said was, so here's what we said, that, that um, well, this is what we said, that the London Force dipoles flip back and forth, and they said benzene is delocalized, so it can't switch. But we never, we, we agreed, one benzene couldn't do it. You need multiple, it takes two to tango. And by the way, the anesthetics get in and prevent this dipole oscillation, and uh, that's how we think anesthesia works. So basically what we're saying is that the, if you see these uh, electron cl uh, clouds, they oscillate back and forth, and, uh, and then we get uh, superposition, and then it, it collapses. Their other objection was about, uh, I said that, so they missed the boat there. And then uh, their other objection was something that, well, let me just show you that we've done more modeling of the tubulin, and this is from Travis Craddock and Jack Tusinski, where the, we look for these aromatic rings. So what you saw before was a cartoon of the aromatic rings, but this is actually the phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So we form these clusters or grooves, and this is where the anesthetics bind. And uh, if we look, if we zoom in, we see it's kind of a, a helical within a helical. And uh, this is known quantum pathway in photosynthesis protein, and this seems to give pathways here that can give rise to topological uh, patterns and giving rise to topological quantum computing, which I mentioned previously. This would be much more efficient, much more resistance to, resistant to decoherence. You'd lose uh, capacity because uh, uh, each pathway would be a, a, bit, a qubit, not an individual tubulin, but you, you gain a lot of uh, resistance. Now, finally, uh, Anurban Vanyapati, who we're going to see tonight in Agra, uh, has done amazing experiments. Here's a, a one microtubule with four electrodes. He then uh, uh, imparts AC energy in the, in the radio frequency range, megahertz, and measures uh, the resistance across the microtubule. And at certain resonant frequencies, 8 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 20, and also down to 12 kilohertz, the microtubule becomes very, very conductive. And you think this is actually a quantum state. So at, at particular resonant frequencies in the megahertz, uh, microtubules become uh, quantum, and that seems to accelerate their, their, um, their activity. So I, I began to wonder, well, megahertz, we use a, a device in medicine called the ultrasound machine, and we use it for imaging. And so um, this, is, this is my brain with ultrasound, and my colleague is, is putting this in. And you don't actually feel the ultrasound, but I noticed after about a minute, I started to feel pretty good. And uh, we did a study... On, in chronic pain patients and showed uh, enhanced mood in chronic pain patients from transcranial ultrasound. So this is ongoing work we're going to be doing. We're going to look at memory effects and brain injury and so forth. Since if you stimulate the microtubules, you should increase uh, synaptic plasticity. Uh, the other complaint about uh, the Australian group was that they say we need a GTP, and actually we don't, and there's no conformational change our original cartoons were de deceiving. The, the big mechanical change is not necessary. That would require heat, uh, uh, emit heat, and not, but if you just have the electron oscillations, then you don't have to worry about that. So um, OrcoWire does not require GTP hydrolysis. So I think we've answered all our critis critics. Oh, here's another one, but uh, Anurban's group uh, has evidence to show that there is some kind of condensation, quantum condensation going on in microtubules. So the evidence seems to be uh, moving in our favor in the last couple of years, and there's uh, more in the pipeline. And so I think we're going to see more and more uh, quantum effects in biology. So um, I'll come back to the conclusion in a second. Let me just mention that um, we organize a conference in Tucson every other year. Uh, it's, this one's coming up in April. I know you have your conference here in January, uh, Toward a Science of Consciousness. And this is a network of, neuron, of cactus meant to look like neurons. We're having it at this resort. So here's the website. I invite all of you to come. And uh, Dave Chalmers and I organize it. And it should be very, very good. We have a very interesting uh, program. So let me just conclude. I'll have time for a few questions. Uh, number one, consciousness is intrinsic to the universe. Uh, in my opinion, biology evolved to connect to, the, to quantum information. Call it platonic values, Akashic record, embedded in fundamental space-time geometry. Two, the penrose hameroff orko -Or theory describes consciousness as quantum computations in brain microtubules, each terminated by this OR objective reduction, 
and thus a process occurring in fundamental space-time geometry. In other words, as we're conscious right now, the, the process going on in our, in our neurons, in our microtubules, and in the, in the space-time geometry between our ears. But because that's non-local, it, it, can, it can extend outwards. Therapies aimed at brain microtubule megahertz resonance, transcranial ultrasound, may be useful in neurological and psychiatric disorders. And finally, according to Orko, our consciousness can be non-local and exist at different fractal-like scales, possibly accounting for astral projection, afterlife, and reincarnation. Now, I'm not claiming any proof of any of these things, but we certainly hear myriad stories, uh, reports from all over the world for thousands and thousands of years, and modern science has dismissed this and say well, it's impossible, but I think that's based on a false assumption. It's based on the idea that the brain is a classical computer. If we take into consideration quantum computing and the, the Penrose mechanism and get this uh, connection to non-local space-time geometry, then I think these things become possible and, and we can have sort of a, a, uh, a merger or a, a, a <clears throat> rapprochement between e at least Eastern spirituality and modern science. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.